So we figured out we're talking about beer today. This is actually um, from Ninkazi. Do you remember Ninkazi? <laughs> we started the course with. Um, this is their Tricera Hops Double IPA 8%. It's actually really bitter as hell, but I like it that way. Um, and I want to draw your attention to this. Um, it's an odd fangled um, new glass that someone sent me, so I didn't even, um, I didn't consciously buy it. But I rather like the shape of this because um, it does concentrate the aromas right in the front of this glass. I think a mug is perfectly fine and so is a pint bottle, you know, pint uh, glass if you're, if you're drinking out of it. But this you should never drink out of. And it's not a matter of politeness or etiquette or anything like that. You drink like this, what's going up your nose? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Remember, we taste this way, we taste this way, and we also taste in the back of our, where the two meet. But if you drink out of a bottle, you really don't get any of the aroma. What's the point? So this is actually a kind of, a, it sounds sort of silly. And, and I think actually for wine, it, you know, having a different shape wine glass for every single type of wine makes a little sense. But this actually really, oh, you get all this maltiness that comes through and actually balances the beer much nicer in a glass. So obviously we're going to talk about beer in America this time. And uh, I want you to recognize that America has actually always been a place of innovation and experimentation in the brewing of beer. It's not just a recent thing in this latest, uh, you know, craft beer craze. Even in the earliest aborted 16th century colonies in Virginia, they were trying new ways to make beer from indigenous ingredients. For example, Thomas Harriot at Roanoke Island in the 1580s, this is the first time the English try to settle there, he wrote about the corn they encountered. He said, um, we made of the same in the country some malt, wherefore was brewed as good ale as was to be desired. So likewise, by the help of hops, there thereof may be made as good beer. So he's using uh, presumably maize to make a kind of beer, which he said, it's okay, it's fine. We need some hops, bring them over. Now, I think to some extent, this was an advertisement inducing people to settle. So perhaps it was a little exaggerated. Maybe it wasn't perfectly great beer. But nonetheless, it's not surprising that much of American beer is made of corn today. Um, and you might be surprised also, a lot of it contains rice. Budweiser contains a lot of rice because uh, it's kind of flavorless, I guess. Now, obviously, we have a lot of corn and it's very cheap. That's why it goes into bourbon and some vodka and things like that. But it goes in mostly into mixes of American-style mass-produced lagers. And I'll use that word because we tend to use the word beer generically. Well, beer does generically mean everything, but specifically the kind of beer that's most popular in the U.S. is actually a lager. Um, and the early settlers didn't use um, it by choice, but by necessity. That's why they, they use the corn. They certainly would have preferred malted barley if they gotten their hands on it. But actually where they landed in the south, um, it really doesn't grow that well. So it's, it's, too, um, it's too hot and moist and humid in the, in the summer. Uh, and it gets cold. So it took, and in fact, it took some effort to establish grain in the north also. That's where it finally succeeds. Now in Massachusetts, despite the um, dour habits of the Puritans, uh, we know that among their provisions, they brought with them to the New World. And um, one of the foods on which they expected to be sustained, as had, of course, Englishmen for centuries before, was ale and hopped beer. Okay, They made that the distinction back then, with, is that it was if it had hops in it, it was beer. And in fact, when William Bradford landed with the Mayflower in 1620, one of the primary reasons they said, okay, guys, stop, there's a rock over there, Plymouth Rock, uh, in what we now call New England, or actually they, they were going to call it Norimbega. Um, it was where, that's where they planned to go. But they stopped at that rock because, primarily because they were running out of beer, uh, believe it or not. So uh, in the morning, uh, I'll, I'll read you his account. After we had called upon God for direction, we came to this resolution to go presently ashore again and to take a better view of the two places which we thought most fitting for us. 
for we could not now take time for further search or consideration, our victuals being much spent, vittles, I guess you could call them, especially our beer, and it being now the 20th of December, meaning Christmas is upon us, we must have beer. Okay, so the Puritans did drink beer, like all Englishmen. Okay? The situation was equally dire for the colonists who settled Jamestown in 1607, where they were forced to drink water which was brackish, meaning a little salty, and made them sick. And the first thing they wanted to trade, any ship that showed up, the first thing they asked for is beer. They, they said, we need beer, quickly. Uh, they even a advertised in London to bring a master brewer along. And in uh, 1629, John Smith reported that the colony had in fact successfully built two breweries using barley malt and native corn mixed. So they, they, they figured it out, okay, there. In the Massachusetts Bay Colony, at least to start, they were actually importing malt to make their beer. They, didn't, they couldn't grow it to start. And keep in mind, the population grew very, very quickly in the north. Um, and it was concentrated in towns rather than spread out on plantations. So people probably, as they had in England, started brewing at home. But very soon in Massachusetts, it became commercially oriented, exactly as it had been in England by this time. People were, were producing beer for trade. And by the late... 1630s into the early 1640s, there was a, in Charlestown, Charlestown's right across from Boston, it's the older city, um, there was a Maltster's Lane, okay, that's where they first settled, and there was a lane where the people who malted the barley lived, and, uh, and a couple of commercial breweries there, um, but in Porting malt and hops was, of course, very expensive, so they started experimenting with the local corn also. Uh, John Winthrop, in fact, you know, he was the, one of the founders, uh, wrote a paper for the Royal Society on experiments with trying to malt corn. This is uh, sent in 1622. He wanted to sprout it and then dry it, just like you do barley. And it seems like at this point, to get some flavor and color, because remember, if, you, if you're if you using corn to make a, a brew, it's going to be light and taste sort of weird and funky. They started adding molasses to see what would happen. They started adding persimmons, pumpkins, peaches, anything that they might use as a base um, sugar and other local plants to preserve it because they didn't have hops. Uh, and, in, and in fact, they used uh, quite often spruce. And I know that sounds sort of weird, but spruce, the tips of spruce contain a lot of vitamin C. So it's really very good at, against scurvy. So spruce beer is another one of those um, um, kind of, so it's one of those sodas, basically, that we talked about last time, but very sort of um, tangy and, and uh, astringent, but very, very good for, for your health. Now, remarkably, one trick they may have learned from the Native Americans was this uh, use of these spruce buds. I don't think people back in England use them because they have this, um, again, walloping amount of vitamin C. And especially in winter, remember, there's no fresh vegetables in, uh, in New England. And so uh, they tried it out in beer in place of hops to see if that would actually um, cause the astringency and act as a preservative. And in fact, there are a couple of companies now that still make spruce beer. There's one in Canada. There's a thing in, in Scandinavia, oddly enough, it's more popular. Um, and let me give you um, an 18th century recipe. This is from Amelia Simmons. It's a wonderful cookbook. It's actually the first American cookbook that uses American ingredients and, and uh, like corn and pumpkins and things. But let me give you this recipe. It's, it's quite interesting. It says, take four ounces of hops, let them boil half an hour in one gallon of water, strain the hop water, then add 16 gallons of warm water, two gallons of molasses, eight ounces of essence of spruce, I'm not sure where she got that, dissolved in one quart of water, put it in a clean cask and shake it well together, add half a pint of Emptons, that's the yeast starter, and let it stand to work for one week. If very warm weather, less time will do. And when it's drawn off to the bottle, add one spoonful of molasses to every bottle, and that would give it a nice color like this also. So. So people in the, this is a very early 19th century, um, or the late 18th century, had been doing things like this out of the indigenous ingredients. So when you, again, my point is that the, you know, when you look at all the crazy things people are throwing into beer nowadays, including pumpkins in this season, um, they've been doing it for a long time. Right? It's nothing really, it's nothing out of the ordinary for American beer. And in fact, the Dutch settlers had by and large beaten Virginia and Massachusetts in the brewing business, as they had in many other uh, distilled 
beverages because they did manage to plant barley and hops all the way up the Hudson Valley and were supplying the English colonies with beer and, and especially trading it for tobacco with the South. Um, for example, Adrian Block and Hans Christian and Anderson, uh, sorry, Hans Christensen, <laughs> Hans Christian Anderson, he's the, the writer, um, set up a brewery in 1612. So that's, that may be the oldest. Uh, and around this time, is recorded the first taxation on beer in the New World also. Remember, it always goes along with taxes. Uh, New Amsterdam became the first brewing center in the New World. Um, they had established 10 breweries by the time the English took over the colony in 1660. So New York has always been brewing central. Uh, and the breweries, incidentally, stayed there after the English took over. Uh, one of these brewing families, you might know this name, it's quite interesting, is um, were of the name Rutgers a member of which Henry Rutgers was a Revolutionary War hero and became the benefactor of what was then called Queen's College in New Brunswick and uh, founded in 1766, which is now presently Rutgers um, University. Okay, so my, my sister went there. So uh, it's in New Jersey. But in, in any case, it was a Dutch beer company, beer family. That's where the wealth came from that endowed that university. The other major brewing center after Boston and New York Sorry, had to let the cat out. <laughs> um, after uh, New York was the found, newly founded colony of Pennsylvania, founded by the Quaker William Penn in 1680 uh, in Philadelphia for various reasons, but partly because of uh, religious toleration, quickly grew to be actually the largest city in the colonies. That's Philadelphia. Uh, and actually, surprisingly, in the 18th century, Philadelphia was the second largest English-speaking city in the entire world. Believe it or not, Philadelphia just, just exploded. Um, and the reason is, of course, Penn, as a religious radical himself, invited all sorts of other people from Germany and elsewhere, uh, and Quakers and, and Jews even, to come and settle in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, but he actively promoted breweries. He wanted to make this one of the colony's exports. And by 1685, someone named William Frampton was brewing beer. He was described as a, an able man who has set up a large brew house in order to furnish the people with good drink. So there's large-scale brewing there, right from the start. And as we know um, from former lecture, the colonial America was actually awash in whiskey, right? Remember, I mean, it was, it was easier to make from anything because the flavor of it just at this stage didn't really matter. Uh, it was much easier to transport, right? So, so whiskey was really the big winner in the colonial Americas, but beer, of course, was a relatively sober alternative to spirits, um, and spirits were, uh, and was always less heavily taxed also. So, so it remained that in cities where you could have breweries, beer was the drink of choice um, because it didn't have to travel far and it's, it's, uh, they don't tax it and you don't have to go through that whole extra stage of distilling and firing it up and, and so forth. They don't have a lot of wood in their cities anyway. So, so in the hinterland, whiskey rules in cities, it's generally more uh, beer. And a very typical brewer of the 18th century is a guy we are all familiar with. His name is, of course, Sam Adams. Um, and evidence suggests, actually, that he wasn't even a brewer. He was probably a maltster. He was probably the guy who bought up the um, barley, sprouted, malted it, and then resold it to brewers. But the, um, so the company may be actually using his likeness with a glass of beer under false pretenses. I don't know, in all honesty. But nonetheless, he did promote drinking of native beer over imported wine. That was sort of an act of patriotism. It was just like drinking something else other than tea, right? Which was, of course, gave money into the British Empire. Um, and that also meant that he had to try and figure out more local ingredients, especially when there were embargoes against British goods leading up to the revolution. You know, remember the, the whole business with arbitrary taxation and no representation. So, um, so Sam Adams is one of these very pioneer probably i don't know if he actually brewed beer but of course there's a sam adams brewing company now that, that likes to play on that history uh now benjamin franklin's much quoted though garbled um uh, saying is that uh, beer is proof that god loves us and wants us to be happy and in a letter to andre morellet of 1779 
That's actually not what he said. <laughs> okay, let me let me read you the the real thing. Okay, behold the rain which descends from heaven upon our vineyards. There it enters the roots of the vines to be changed into wine, a constant proof that God loves us, loves us and wants us to be happy. So not only is it wine, but he's, he's actually talking about rain. <laughs> he's talking about what falls down, and that's God's providence. Um, and uh, Franklin was definitely more of a wine drinker anyway. So... Uh, but but the early you know the early our, our founding fathers were definitely um, well you know George Washington was a distiller and he loved whiskey but he also liked beer very much and there exists in the New York Public Library a copy of his handwritten recipe for small beer and you know what small beer means that means uh, not much alcohol in it so it's everyday drinking beer okay? it's strange but let me read it anyway take a large sifter. Uh, it's a sifter, I guess, full of bran hops to your taste. Uh, boil these three hours, then strain out 30 gallons into a cooler and put in three gallons of molasses while the beer is scalding hot, or rather draw the molasses into the cooler and strain the beer on it while boiling hot. Let this stand till it is a little more than blood warm and pour in a quart of yeast. If the weather is good, uh, very cold, cover it over with a blanket and let it work in the cooler 24 hours and put it in the cask leave the bung open till it is almost done working bottle it the, that day a week it was brewed okay so it takes, takes so so it sounds actually pretty awful okay <laughs> that uh, and it would be very low in alcohol and i think it's no wonder that washington actually preferred when to buy porter from robert hare of philadelphia now let me explain what this what i mean by porter um this was a new drink, a new kind of beer, uh, fashionable in London, especially in the 18th century. Porter is made from malt that is very, very darkly toasted, so it's black in color. It's made with a whole lot of hops, so it's rather bitter too. They are matured a very long time in oak casks, and the logic behind this is the higher sugar content and the keeping in casks and the higher hops make it last longer. Okay, you can keep a long store of this. Um, and people have argued that porter is really the very first industrial beer. By, and by industrial, I mean made with machines and made you know, in a factory, not just in a concentrated operation. Um, obviously, it wasn't made this way in the colonies uh, because they... Um, but the, when I say industrial beer, I mean in 1784, Henry Goodwin and Samuel Whitbread, Whitbread is still a very big name of, of uh, cheap beer in, in Britain, used a coal-fired steam engine in their brewery in London. Um, and if that's, of course, the way that all beer is going to be made very soon. It's going to be mechanized with, with um, mechanical sluices and tubs and as much as possible mechanized, right? And the other new industrial beer... In, quite different not not um his, has no historical precedent really which is specifically made stronger and even stronger with more hops was designed to export to of all places india and this is why it's called ipa india pale ale because it's being sent to india it's not really made there and by the early 19th century this uh, and it's it, this is actually an, this is an ipa See right there, double IPA. Very funny that we still use that on a bottle, right? This is a very, very high alcohol, high hops kind of beer. They didn't get it to this high. It's eight percent, but um, that's that's where, where it comes from. Uh, early nineteenth century industrial production. Um, by the early nineteenth century, this became a popular style in the U.S. Okay, this was if you were to be here a couple hundred years ago, this is what your beer would probably be like. Um, Robert Smith Pale Ale Brewing Company was founded in Philadelphia um, at two, and started making something that was probably very like this. Similar breweries popped up in other cities, Baltimore, New York. Um, remember Washington held his farewell address after the revolution on the steps of the Francis Tavern in 1783. It's actually one of the only colonial buildings left in New York City, still standing. And, um, and beer was served, right? So breweries also began springing up in smaller cities. Um, there's one that's that's very interesting also. I don't know what the the connection of beer with higher education is, but in uh, Poughkeepsie, which was a young town up up uh, on Hudson, a guy by the name of Matthew Vassar 
opened up a brewery and made so much money that he later founded the college of that same name, Vassar. Um, so the connection between beer and college is not uh, coincidental. That's the, that's the second one founded by a brewer. So up to about 1840, there were a, a, a wide range of different kinds of ales and beers produced in the U.S., all in some way or another replicating what was British ale, right? That's That was our first, we learned from them because the majority of people who came were British, or they were the ones in control, basically. Um, and they began to use industrial processes in the 19th century, um, but they're still basically doing it the old-fashioned way, right? Chemically, it's still fermented at room temperature. It's still got top fermented yeast, okay? So this is, they're still what we would call ales, right? Now, everything changes when there is an influx of German brewers who basically take over the entire industry and introduce something very different. Remember that cooler kind of bottom fermented lager that's typical in southern Germany, uh, and especially Pilsen. Pilsen is in uh, Bohemia, but it's now the, the Czech Republic. Uh, and the audience for these was also present in a massive wave of immigration to Germany, especially to Pennsylvania and uh, Philadelphia. And this, so this new kind of beer kind of came with them. John Wagner introduced, or I should say Wagner, uh, introduced this different kind of yeast, and the beer was brewed in the cold cellar in his house in Philadelphia. This is the first time they saw light, effervescent beer served cold. In the 1840s, 1.7 million people arrived from Germany. Um, in the 1850s, 2.6 million Germans arrived, and they began to fan out. And they, and they left that, the, the coast... So many of them left the coast to places in the Midwest. So if you think of St. Louis and Milwaukee especially, um, there were also, uh, the exact same time, Ger um, the uh, Irish started appearing because of the potato famine in the middle of the century. Uh, and they're, of course, also avid beer drinkers. And in the 19th century, the German-style beers, these lagers, that means to lay down, means you're putting it in the basement, completely dominated the brewing city uh, brewing scene, and every city and most towns also had their own breweries. Very, very typical because you want the product to be fresh and local, and remember there's no such thing as pasteurization yet, okay? So companies like, for example, Schaefer in New York. Um, when I was growing up, there was a little jingle. Schaefer is the one beer to have when you're having more than one. <laughs> and at, uh, right across the river in Brooklyn, there was Rheingold, which also had a jingle. My beer is Rheingold, the dry beer. It's refreshing, not sweet. It's the dry Rheingold treat. <laughs> so these, these things, of course, were on the radio and on TV. And they just, the advertising alcohol was legal then. So as a little kid, I could hear it. Um, so there were, there were hundreds of breweries in the cities. Um, in Philadelphia, they had Schmitz and Keystone. And, um, but the biggest ones, the really, the ones that were so successful in, um, in, in mechanizing and industrializing everything were founded by Germans in the Midwest. This was the, uh, the brewery founded by Philip Best passed into the hands of his son-in-law, whose name was Frederick Pabst. Pabst is, uh, is the, still you know, one of the big, big breweries. And Milwaukee was also where Schlitz was founded by uh, Joseph Schlitz. Also, Frederick Miller, who bought this defunct brewery, apparently when he was 31 years old, he said, I want to be a brewer, and let's uh, do it. And so, so Milwaukee was literally built on beer. It was also built on grain, I should say. When the Erie Canal opened, um, well, much of the grain came then from the Midwest, went through, was milled in Milwaukee and, and sent elsewhere. That was possible, but just, beer is just as much. Um, the other major brewing center was, of course, St. Louis, uh, the 18-year-old Adolphus Busch went into business and eventually joined Eberhard Anhauser, <laughs> Busch and Anhauser. Um, and he married his daughter, in fact, and came out with a beer called Randomly after one of the great bohemian cities of beer production, which in uh, Czech is Czeske Budijovice. In German, which there were a lot of Germans there too, was called Budweiss and hence the name of this beer, Budweiser, okay? And I can vouch for the fact that at least today, the Budweiser in Bohemia bears absolutely no relation whatsoever to the Budweiser, bud to the bud made in, uh, in the U.S. They have nothing to do with each other. And in fact, it's a strange irony in this case is that the Czech beer 
could not get an appellation. They couldn't get a law passed to say that only we can make this. This is the name of our town. Champagne can do it, but poor, poor Budjovic couldn't. Um, so the American company continued to use the name because in the U.S. at least it was trademarked from a very early day. And so the Czech Budweiser companies have to sell their beer under a different name in the U.S. Isn't that funny? They can't call it Budweiser, even though that's the name of the, set, the city where it comes from. And uh, Budweiser, of course, is sold pretty much everywhere under its own name. Um, it's, just, it's just one of those weird quirks of history. Um, now, the reason these breweries dominated on the East Coast, I think above everything else, was the fact that they embraced the new, newest technologies. They were the very first to use refrigeration to keep everything cold. Um, and people, you know, beer cold is really refreshing and lovely. So uh, they were also the first to automate the bottling lines. Oh gosh, do you remember the uh, Laverne and Shirley, the episode where they're, they're working the bottling line and put their gloves on it and wave goodbye? I mean, that's, that's real. Um, and I think also maybe the first to employ the latest discoveries of this Frenchman, Louis Pasteur. Hey, Pasteur, he's going to run through this whole course. Um, we know his name. We know the word pasteurization. But uh, few people know that his discoveries uh, were the result of his work for breweries. To, he was hired to tell them why their beer was going sour and bad. And he said, well, let me look closely with his big fancy microscope and basically discovered bacteria. Good bacteria and bad bacteria and yeast and, and other little microbes. And essentially, he figured out that if you heat something to a temperature, um, usually boiling point, for a length of time long enough to kill all the bacteria and pathogens and then seal it in a container, hermetically sealed, nothing else can enter and it will last much longer. So in fact, there had been canning before Pasteur, but no one understood the science behind it. It took Pasteur to say, oh, look, look, there's these bacteria and yeast and molds and things. So by the late 19th century, this technology revolutionizes the food industry, Industry, right? I'm burping beer, um, pardon me. Um, so, so fruits were canned, vegetables were canned, meat, I mean, like a spam, I think milk by Borden, condensed milk was canned. Just about anything that might spoil, people figured out how to put in a can, ship far away, and leave it on a shelf until someone wanted to buy it. Right? And this includes beer, folks. So, of course, that made shipping long distances in durable cans of beer uh, far more viable. And cans are not that heavy, right? I mean, aluminum cans are really light. Um, glass is, is what they used to start. But, but let's wonder about the, the cost of this, okay? And I don't mean just cost in the price of the beer. Cost is a little different. And it's, you know, it's, it's of course, very nice to have shelf-stable beer if you want to keep a store somewhere and, or put it in your larder, of course. That means it can sit in a warehouse for a long time or on the store shelf. Pasteurization, though, also literally kills the beer. What do I mean by that? It means all the symbiotic microbes that make it interesting and funky and weird and really aromatic and tasty, you are killing everything. And these are not just there accidentally. They're causing the flavor to happen. And they are similar bacteria to those creatures that make cheese lovely. They cause meat to cure. So you think salamis and hams and corned beef and all sorts of stuff like that. And of course, pickles. Right? Pickles are, there's, there's live pickles, which are, have live lactobacillic cultures in them and you, they're refrigerated. And then there's the pasteurized kind, which you see on the shelf, which have been boiled and usually flavored with vinegar, not with uh, real lactobacillic cultures. So beer, as a result, has to become much more homogenous to pasteurize it. But they want it to be completely the same all the time and they're going to pasteurize it so that whenever you get beer it's going to be the same product because it will be there maybe a few months and maybe who knows how long it's going to be on the shelf unlike when you draw it from a cask it's going to be very different each batch and depending on the weather and the in fact all those early recipes remember they talked about the weather it will, will determine how long it's fermented well now you have it in a factory you can control the temperature you can control everything right down to the point that you put it in a bottle, it's going to be the exact same product every time. And if there's variation in the quality of the malt or the grain or whatever, you want to get rid of that. You want to, you want to efface that. So you're going to, you know, 
brew it in, in a way that's going to be the lowest common denominator, the least flavor you can. Um, and of course, these big breweries, um, you know, not only do they want the beer very consistent, but they want to be able to have an advantage over the smaller breweries. And this happens in, throughout the whole food industry. They can buy up ingredients in bulk at much better prices. They can go to a, one farmer and say, I'll buy every everything you have, <laughs> right? And, and give him a low price, but at least he knows he's going to sell it all. They can undersell by cutting corners. They also spend a lot on advertisement, but they, um, you know, they cut better deals with distributors because they're working in bulk. They get favorable deals to have their products served in bars, right? I mean, there's, there's all sorts of, I don't want to go into all of this, but there's all sorts of really fascinating back history to the way distribution works. Who goes, who, who gets to sell in what store or served in what bar is very, very complicated. And it's, you can't just show up and sell to, to any given place. And, and every state is a different law, of course, now. So where that leads me, of course, is nothing was as disastrous to the beer industry in the United States as prohibition. Um, it didn't just suddenly burst on the scene. In fact, Maine had prohibited alcohol in 1850. So it's a long, long before. A handful of other states followed suit, but really the late 19th century is when this whole movement gained momentum following what was then called the National Temperance Society in 1893, founded by or led by Howard Hyde Russell was the person's name. And it was founded, interestingly, by some of the most powerful men in the country, J.P. Morgan. So if you have money or stocks invested with J.P. Morgan, know that they were, they were prohibitionists. Um, John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie. So, you know, Carnegie Mellon University, um, and of course, Carnegie Steel, everything, you know, the trains, whatever. So these were all, pro they were all in favor of prohibition and funded this campaign. And the legislation was spearheaded by a group called the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Everyone had basically just been fed up with alcohol at this point, and they said, let's just get rid of it. It'll make life so much easier. Um, and they had big backing to, to advertise this. And their target, you know, their target, in all honesty, was really, it really seemed to be hard alcohol. They were against whiskey. And most of the breweries who of course could have mounted a counter offense you know or defended themselves they didn't think it would apply to them they they thought oh they're, they're getting rid of distilled drinks right because that's the real problem but beer everyone knows beer is perfectly good for you and healthy and and, and they they didn't do anything about it they didn't they didn't think temperance would apply to them they thought wine and beer will be fine and what they're going to get rid of is whiskey so to give you an idea of who and what these people were like the quintessential temperance advocate of the era was a woman named Carrie Nation um, and a dowdy old lady who would show up in a saloon with an axe would start singing hymns and would bust up the uh, the kegs um, and, and so she was crazy okay <laughs> let's put it that way and um, you know, well, well, actually, in class, we'll take a look at a picture of hers and maybe maybe sing one of her her battle hymns. But the, she would show up with these people and just start breaking, um, breaking up saloons, breaking the chairs, threatening people. So, in any case, state by state, prohibited alcohol. Um, the breweries, of course, started to close, and the smaller ones, of course, were the first to go. Five hundred of breweries closed in the nineteen uh, teens. And finally, the Brewers founded an organization to combat the Dries, as they were called. Um, and uh, they called this the Brewers Association, which would be a coalition of everyone involved in the whole process. So the farmers, the brewers, the glassmakers, the distributors, the bar owners, the shopkeepers. We have, there's a lot of people behind this. It's not just, you know, a couple of industrial, you know, interests. Basically, anyone who was connected to the industry in any way said, all right, it's time we stop this movement. And the organization, as might be expected from people in the business, was largely funded by a, an outside group. And this always happens, right? A lobbying group. They were called the National German Alliance, a German-American Alliance, kind of a cultural organization that was to promote German culture and language in the U.S. And, of course... What really happened that doomed the effort of this 
alliance organization and their effort to save beer. Well, the timing could not possibly have been worse because in 1917, unexpectedly, we got into a war with Germany. And suddenly, everything German was suspect. In fact, the word Frankfurter, which was everyone had called it up until that point, begins to be called a hot dog. Um, silly, I know, but, uh, you know, when we were at war with Germany, it's really kind of an, a fascinating topic. I've always, always found this, this sort of um, cultural pull. It's, it's also the time, very interestingly, in a Western Civ class, when you would, not, you would no longer start with the roots of German culture, as the origin of the of uh, trial by jury and democracy and all this stuff. Now suddenly Greece, that, that's really where it all began. <laughs> if you look at the um, Western Civ textbooks, they all changed during the war. So in any case, um, I think it was suspicion over the activities of the German community and especially the brewers that pushed legislation in the US. So the fact that we got into war with Germany is why prohibition happened, more or less. So in 1919, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution was passed. It's called the Volstead Act, designed to enforce prohibition. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that most people were actually not so enthusiastic about this. They had no intention of obeying it from the very start. And moreover, it encouraged um, drinking of, I don't know, again, I don't know why they call it bathtub gin, but but home distilled swill, whiskey, um, or or things that were shipped illegally from Canada. There would be, um, people would, would truck it over the frozen ice. I think this is where we got the taste for Canadian Club and those kind of rye whiskeys. They would um, send it over the Great Lakes and into Northern America. Or there would be rum runners, people who would ride the rum um, up from the Caribbean to Florida and drop it off at the ports there and sell it illegally. Uh, I think the, the, the interest in rum flavored drinks, that's of course where it comes from. And uh, because you you know you can't really spot someone carrying a suitcase of a couple of, bo of you know a dozen bottles of beer, harder to spot than someone rolling a few kegs, right? So so all, smuggled alcohol is always always distilled, and you know you would you would never smuggle smuggle wine or beer. And of course the um, instead of preventing crime, which was the whole idea behind prohibition, is less there'll be less alcoholism, there'll be less um, crime connected to it the exact opposite happened because organized crime, the mob, stepped in as the distributors. You couldn't legally distribute alcohol, so criminal activity you know, came in and did that for them. And they had, of course, much more violent ways of dealing with their competition. So, um, you know, someone muscles in on your territory, you, you, you gun them down. You, you know, the, the crime rate actually went up dramatically as a result of prohibition. And the officers who were charged with the task of policing the um, U.S. were ridiculously few. Uh, despite the heroics of people like Elliot Ness, there were, um, you know, a few dozen um, agents who were supposed to stop all this alcohol from coming in from abroad. Um, Fiorello LaGuardia, who you might know from the, the airports named after him, was the mayor of New York City. At the time, he said, uh, at the time of Prohibition, he said, Prohibition might actually be a good idea, but it's never been tried. <laughs> Meaning that people went on drinking illegally, of course. Um, so how did brewers survive this onslaught of their industry? Uh, most of them didn't, of course. Some made very, very low alcohol beer that was uh, legal. Most of them turned to malted milk. That's the only reason we have that product. So they had all this malted grain. I said, let's flavor milk with it and make... Um, it's, a, it's a process similar to beer making, so they can use some of the same equipment and things. Um, but, you know, when you eat a malted milk ball, and that's why we have that stuff. Others tried to move into different industries. It's very difficult to do. If you have, you know, tanks for brewing beer, there's not much else you can do with it. Um, maybe soda, but but not really. So when Prohibition was repealed, very few could actually start up again. Their business had gone completely out. And, of course, the only f ones who did survive were the really big ones who had diversified or had capital invested elsewhere so they could just um, shut up their doors during Prohibition, make money, continue to make money. And then when Prohibition ended, they opened them again. There were very few of those. But um, other forces made it very profitable for the big breweries and impossible for small breweries to survive. And again, it was the scale 
and the pervasiveness of advertising, I think that really made the difference here because it was now allowed everywhere. You could see ads on TV, brand new thing, radio, billboards, magazines, newspapers, beer ads were literally everywhere. Uh, a process of consolidation also allowed the uh, smaller brewer, any surviving smaller breweries to be swallowed up by the big ones because the big ones have money. They just buy them and put them out of business or, or conglomerate and uh, or they convert them into their own breweries. Easy enough, right? So another factor here is, is transport is absolutely essential to this whole question also because highways made distribution across the whole country possible. And I think, well, let me give you some, some weird statistics. So when I began drinking beer, I think that was the late 70s, okay? So 1979 or so. How old was I? I was, I was in high school. There were 89 brewing companies in the United States. And in fact, in some sources I've read say that there were fewer than 50. I don't know, you know what, the, what the exact date is or how they, how they figured that out, but, but there were a few powerhouses maybe a dozen big ones who controlled most of the profit. And through the decades between 1950 and 1980, the top 10 went from owning only 38% of the market share in, in, uh, in 1950 to 52% in 1960 to 69% in 1980 to 93% in, uh, sorry, 93% in 1980. 69 in 1970, 93 in 1980. So that means that, that almost all the wealth was owned by um, just a couple of the top 10 breweries. Um, it made, made everything. Let me give you a, uh, some statistics. I found these. They're, they're actually very interesting. Not hard to find at all. The top 10 brewers in the U.S. These are all, I think, still around. I don't know. But let's look. So the number one brewer was Anheuser-Busch with 50 million barrels in 1980. Miller came in very close. No, not that close, actually. 37 million barrels. Pabst had 15 million. Schlitz had 14 million. Coors, which was also around then, had 13 million. Heilemann Brewing Company had 13 million. I don't know if that's still around. It was an East Coast beer, really, really bad. Stroh's had 6 million. Olympia Brewing Company had 6 million. Falstaff Brewing, I'm not sure if that exists anymore. It was 13, 3 million. And uh, likewise, Schmidt and Sons was uh, 3 million. Schmidt's, I don't think, is around anymore. But in any case, those are the top 10. They owned the whole, the whole business, everything, in 1980. So what happened? How did this turn around? Isn't this remarkable? So from my perspective, it is a complete and utter reversal of fortune in the time that I have been following the beer industry. Um, and although the big breweries still actually control about, I think this year it's about 85% of the, uh, in terms of sales, is, is still the top big breweries, there is a world of difference in that remaining, I think it's about 15% of craft breweries now. And it started actually with a couple of oddball places. Um, let me give you just a, just a little history behind the craft brewing movement. There was... Um, Fritz Maytag, and you recognize that name, he's actually the, a descendant of the Maytag, you know, you know a washing machine family. So uh, they decided to buy a quirky little brewery in San Francisco that had gone out of business uh, called, and, uh, called Anchor Steam. And this uh, Anchor Steam went back to 1896. And in 1965, when the Maytags had an interest in it, um, they bought it, and by 1970s, they were making a porter, they were making an India Pale Ale, things Americans had never tasted, right? Everything American was, was uh, lager. They made a barley wine. Barley wine's really weird. It's, it's, a, it's distilled and uh, often fortified, but it's, it's higher than this. It's like 12%. It's the highest. Uh, that's why they can't legally even call it beer. Um, these are things that Americans hadn't seen since the 19th century, he also inspired other brewers to get into the act. So there was the New Albion Brewery in Sonoma making a cask-conditioned ale, which was very much like what they were doing in Britain. Um, that was also a, a real microbrewery, one, a very interesting historical one. It's, it wasn't very long-lived, short-lived, but the um, workers there also uh, left and founded the Mendocino Brewing Company, which is in Hopland. So, so they're... 
so it's so the new Albion one was kind of the the father of the of lots of other brewers, um, and I have to tell you, California was one place of this renaissance of craft brewing, brewers, but it wasn't the only one. Um, the other place was Britain, where there had been a similar process of consolidation. It, the brew, number of breweries had shrunk, and um, and fresh local ale conditioned in casks was really really rare. But they began to call it real ale. They began to say that this is the real stuff. Everything else is industrially made in junk. And so there was, there was a, in fact, call of the real ale movement that began picking up momentum even earlier than in the U.S. This is the 70s because, of course, they had a history of it there, right? And this, they would, the, the real ale com- movement would certify places making traditional local brews and especially those that drafted it. That's what to draft means, right? To draw. You have a pump and it actually draws through pressure and... Uh, right out of the cask into your, into your mug. And, and wood, of course, does flavor the beer, just like it does wine. It adds a whole other level of complexity. Um, but it means it's room temperature. It's not fizzy. <laughs> All the things that people associate with a bit of British beer not being great. It is lovely, trust me. So right about this time, people also began to get interested in home brewing. And I have to tell you... Um, it's, well, I mean, it's a very big thing now. Almost any city you live in, you can buy home brewing equipment. When I tried it for the first time, uh, I was in high school. I bought this kit from a, from a pharmacist in Britain called Boots. It was the, they call them the chemist there, but it's basically like CVS, you know, or, uh, or Walgreens. And they, I think I was about 16. And it's a big kit that came with uh, the wort already made and these packets and the hop packets. And so you just... You're really just mixing the thing. It was pretty, pretty foolproof. And it came in a big plastic, you know, five gallon pouch that you hung over a door. It was actually a really lot of fun, uh, but you didn't need any equipment. That was why they were so popular. And uh, it was, it was fine. It was actually okay. I, I remember serving it at a cast party. It was, was fun. So about the same time, specialty uh, pubs started selling imported beers in bottles. So all of a sudden people are tasting British beer for the first time. Samuel Smith's um, oh, Old Peculiar was really popular then. It was That was my favorite when I was in, in college. Bass Ale suddenly appeared. Um, Newcastle Brown, which is one of the only legal hallucinogenic substances. No, it's not really, but that's what they claim. Uh, this Newcastle's way, way up in the north. And, and, uh, and, of course, Guinness, right? People in the U.S. had never really tasted Guinness on tap. Uh, by the time I went to college, that was a reality. There were places that had the... Uh, proper, um, uh, I think it's nitrogen, it's the gas that they put in to make it all fizzy and that, that lovely white head that you get on top of a thing of Guinness. People started traveling to Europe also and tasting all these wonderful European beers. So I think really the generation that really became, I shouldn't say connoisseurs of beer because it's not, not really an expensive thing, they became real drinkers of, of interesting beer, not interested in just guzzling lager with a very tail end of the baby boomers, so people about my age, um, that suddenly realized American beer is really kind of dull. Okay? Um, in this je- decade, and I remember it so distinctively, Sam Adams pops up, and they're in a really neat brewery in Boston you can go visit. Sierra Nevada pops up. Uh, Brooklyn Lager, which is still there. Uh, Pete's Wicked, I don't even think that's around anymore. That was one of the early ones. Uh, a handful of other small companies popped up. Uh, some of them, like Pete's, actually outgrew their facilities and they ended up renting space in huge breweries. So how how, how craft going to be at that point? Um, and of course, it became apparent that when you succeed very well and you start expanding, you often lose the quality and the freshness and the local character. If it's, you know, everything has, all, all, all beer has to be pasteurized now. So that's not, not a question. But it's, um, but the idea that you could... Uh, have it fresh right on the tap in your little brew pub. It's a new idea, okay? I'll, I'll come back to it in a sec. Um, but I think the um, the worse, worse than that phenomenon is the fact that large breweries started looking at these little weird upstarts and saying, well, we can make that too. And they would take their ordinary beer, put caramel food coloring in it, and say, here's our Kraft Miller Dark. <laughs> you know, some absolute garbage. Um, you know, and, and in the long run, most of, those, most of those experiments failed because people tasted it and said, this is the same exact beer as the lager you make and it's just brown. You're not fooling us. So 
Let me give you some, some statistics about this growth. I'm, I'm just sort of babbling about it. But according to the Brewers Association, uh, I'm quoting here, the number of craft brewers has gone from eight in 1980, just eight in the country, to 537 in 1994, to over 2,300 in 2012. And I... Um, uh, and that number has skyrocketed in the past three years. As of when I wrote these notes in, in uh, June 2013, there were 1,500 new breweries in development in the U.S. Uh, so now there's probably about 4,000, is, is my guess. Um, of these breweries, okay, when I wrote these notes, 2,538 in the U.S., the majority the majority of them are designated as craft breweries. So there's still only, you know, the big ones are still, there's only about 50 big breweries, but the um, the increase of craft breweries is 2,750%, okay, or something like, I don't know where I got that number, but it's, um, and in this decade, this is the only decade that the, that the number of breweries that existed in the 1890s, we've now surpassed that number a century later. Um, now, having said of that, the percentage of the market share is still actually quite small. Craft brewing sales uh, share in 2012 was 6.5 percent by volume, 10.2 percent by vo by dollars because it's usually more expensive, right? Um, that went up a, about a percent from a decade before. Um, 409 breweries or craft brew pubs opened in 2012. 2,347 craft breweries operated for some or all of the year 2012, uh, comprised of 1,132 brew pubs, 1,118 microbreweries, and 97 regional craft breweries. And there are more. You know, um, you know, we 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 have our own brewery here in Stockton. I don't know whether you knew that the Valley Brew actually opened on the very day that I moved here. Or <laughs> so it's uh, and it's still there. Um, their beer is like this you know it was very good i think when they started um and now we have a couple of other places um that i don't know how they how or whether they really qualify you know bj's is, is a big chain i don't they don't actually brew there i don't think um there's a one also down on pacific that they don't brew on the premises but they carry a lot of very interesting home brew stuff so there's, there's a lot of good beer in stockton despite what what you might think but the the question that i want to ask is why did this happen you know, how did uh, craft beer emerge out of practically nowhere? And what does it mean as a cultural phenomenon? Well, ultimately, I think it has been part of a larger craft aesthetic that comes to the fore in cyclical waves. Uh, and it expresses itself not just in alcohol and beer, but in food and all the arts, in fact. And there are periods in history when people want uh, things made of natural materials. They want clothes made out of natural fibers. They want food that's less processed and more traditional. They want things that are rooted in place, that are craft, right? We use that word. And let's just call this a natural aesthetic that is, of course, opposed to the industrial mass-produced stuff that's homogenous and made by machines and you can buy any, in anywhere, anywhere in every mall, right? Or any supermarket or grocery store. Um, it's in very, very much a homogenous aesthetic. It's there for predictability and, and homogeneity. And I think to some extent, this kind of switch actually follows economic cycles. Um, the economy is down. People want to express their identity and distinction, not through products that are expensive and imported goods, because we've seen a whole lot of that now in the history of alcohol, right? But they want to return to things that take some some knowledge and experience. And again, think of Pierre Bourdieu again here. Um, they want to think of things that give them cultural capital that come from their experience and knowledge, not from just money. You know, anyone can buy a product once it's become ubiquitous, but it takes some discernment and a lot of experience to navigate the likes of a... You go into any major place that sells beer now, and man, there are hundreds of different kinds of beers. The, 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 the beer aisles are, are dizzying. You know, again, walk into Bevmo's and see there's two whole, two or more whole aisles that are, uh, have got hundreds of different craft beers on it. In fact, when, I, when we did a, um, the um, um, chaplain of the university and I did a, did a beer tasting a few years back for um, um, reunion and we just wanted to choose a handful of very interesting beers. And so we walked into Bevmo 
plunk, plunk, plunk. We picked half a dozen off the shelves that were all great. Um, so so it's you find beer. Beer is very easy to find now. And <clears throat> buying a crafty, funky new beer is, of course, a way to gain respect from people. Not because it's expensive, but because it, it is... It's cool in a way that serving Bud just isn't anymore. It means nothing, right? And, of course, there are class associations with both. And this this beer will, of course, cost a bit more. Um, I don't know how much this costs. Five ninety nine. You could buy a six of Bud for the same price. So, but it's not, it's not expensive at all. But I would contend it really does have a lot to do with the flavor. And I think that the... People's taste preferences are so strongly determined, not by universal absolutes of what's good and bad, because, you know, anyone can like anything, but rather by social forces. You know, and we can say that people's taste, their preference in flavor, has actually shifted. Um, and, of course, or, or maybe you could say the tastes of a certain class have shifted. And this is largely the people who it's really appealing to now are younger, they're fairly affluent, they are educated, and those are the people who are who are buying craft brews. Obviously, the you know eighty five percent of buds still being sold is still consumed by people, mostly working classes. But I think, and and, and of course, it'd be a big mistake to to neglect the meaning of beer by looking at class. I think that's very important. Um, and of course, there are also ethnic ethnic markers. You know, there's some beers that sell to a certain ethnicity or a certain race. Um, or, or certain groups of people, um, or, or even just to certain localities, right? Or, or, or city, a brew that belongs to a certain city, people will be very proud of, um, like um, Pab's Blue Ribbon, I don't know. But the, but the craft brew market is mostly middle-class whites under 50. Now, the other weird irony of this story is that though Bud produces um, half the beer sold in this country, most of the really big companies actually even aren't owned by the U.S. anymore. I know it sounds really weird. Anheuser-Busch is owned by a Belgian company, as far as I know, which makes it really weird that that now that they just came out with this can that says America on it. It's not where the profit's going. Uh, Miller is owned by a South African company. And this is true, of course, of, of many food industries. It's not just beer. Um, they tend to be bought up by big multinational conglomerates. So another thing to consider... Also, and I think this complicates the whole issue, is that imported beer accounts for something about like about 14% of sales. So it's equal to craft beer. Um, and a lot of this comes from Mexico. Think of things like Dos Equis. A lot comes from Holland. Uh, think of Heineken. Um, and they're not necessarily good beer, okay? But they do a very good job of marketing in the U.S. And they've held on to a big chunk of our, our um, consumers. And, you know... And they, they do they do fairly sophisticated ads. You know, think of the who who hasn't seen the most interesting man in the world commercials, right? Um, uh, or the really or Heineken actually has some very interesting ads also. So, um, but we can take a look in class if you like. But um, and maybe even some other companies also. But I think what is fascinating is if I really had to predict where all of this is going, is I think the craft brewing segment will only increase i could i can see it being more than a quarter in fact within the next few years of the entire brewing um industries sales and i think the uh, the other breweries will either continue to try and buy up these little craft breweries and sell them the, themselves that's been happening but it will happen more often um and keep them keep them under their own label right but but of course the decisions will be made from corporate center um and I think maybe what we will begin to see also is really uniquely local beer. Now, it's, that exists here and there. But I think they will say, well, we want to get the hops from right here. We want to grow the grain and malt it ourselves or do whatever, whatever it takes to make it really taste of the place. Breweries, breweries are really thinking about this now. And I think that we will see, I'm hoping, the demise of pasteurized beer. Or it'll still be on shelves, of course, and it'll still be, you know, but, but I think the ability to go into a refrigerator case and say, this was brewed yesterday, have a date on a beer, imagine that, so that after a month, and in fact, you can some, sometimes buy those, um, but I think after a month, you know, you shouldn't be drinking the beer, it should be very seasonal, it should be able to, you know, you can make beer year-round, but why not, uh, you know, have it fresh and 
alive and still with the bacteria and yeast that alive in it, I think that makes a very, very big difference in flavor. And maybe we wouldn't depend on things like high alcohol and, and uh, super, super ramped up hops. I don't think that's quite necessary, though I have to say, I like it. So, so uh, we will talk um, maybe about your favorite beers, who knows what, but I'll see you next time. Uh, after this lecture, incidentally, go back and look at winemaking in America. That will be come after this, but I recorded it quite a while ago. So, so look for that and look for the number. Yeah.